two of Mood Swingers. He kicked us off last week, and uh, just great content about, about owning your emotions. Well, that, that's a big one right there. Well, if we would just own our emotions, and um, if you did not get to see that, you can go back and watch the video of that, northrocksa.com. And, or you can get the audio version either way, but if you didn't uh, get a chance to catch that one, I encourage you to go back and, and get that one from last week. And so as we're in this series and we're talking about our moods and our emotions, we want to look at how we can control our emotions before they can control us because that's what happens most of the time. And, and as you look at your moods, and I love this title, Mood Swingers, because if you don't manage your moods, they will manage you. And you'll wake up in just, just terrible moods and your emotions will just run crazy. And the next thing you know, you're chasing them. Okay, maybe you're not that person. You know that person. And if they're sitting beside you, don't elbow them or raise your hand. But you know what I'm talking about. Like their emotions are going 9,000 directions and you see them chasing them. And they're just, sometimes it's a lot of fun to watch. Sometimes it's just sad and you just kind of watch them. It's kind of like with your emotions and your moods, it's kind of like this. Someone in your house gets sick. Maybe they get a cold. And at first you kind of feel sorry for them. You're just like, oh, man, that's, I hate you're sick. And then you maybe take care of them a little bit, you know, a, a cool rag or some water or Sprite or medicine, whatever it is that you bring to them. And, but deep down you're thinking, I'm just glad that's not me, sucker. Because I really don't get sick that often, and you know, it's just not, it's just not, I'm just feeling good today. And then you kind of think, God, why are they being such a baby? It's just a cold. Good Lord, come on, quit, quit laying on the couch all day long. And then the next morning, you wake up, and <clears throat> you have to <clears throat> clear your throat a couple times, because <clears throat> what's this feeling now? And, and then my head feels just a little bit stuffy, and, and what, what's this pressure behind my eyes, and and, and and the next thing you know is you become sick because colds are very contagious. And just like a cold is contagious, so are moods. You've been around that person that, that they're the Debbie Downer. You know, wah, 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 everywhere they go. Uh, you, you, I, I've worked with people. My, my very first job, I worked with a guy that he was, he, was a, he, was, he was a downer. Oh, my Lord. It was awful. It was awful if you had to be anywhere close to him. If you were in a five-mile radius of this guy, it was awful. You felt it. People that are angry all the time, you know, those people, they're just, they're just angry. They're just mad. They're, just, they're ticked off at the world, and they want everybody to know it. That, that you get around them a little bit, and you kind of start noticing, ah, what's, why am I feeling like this? Somebody that's depressed, just kind of just they, they stare at the ground the whole time. Uh, they're, they're, it's, it's not a party when they're around, and, and you kind of catch yourself just like, i got to take a deeper breath because, uh, you know, what's the deal? Or, or maybe the other side of the coin. You know, somebody's just happy all the time. Hey! You may want to punch them, but it's hard to have a frown on your face. That, that joyful person, that, that smiling person, it's just, man, they walk in a room, they just light up a room. You're just glad they're there. Maybe you're that person. And you're just it's, just, it's just a happy place when you show up or when they show up. Because moods matter. They matter. And today we're going to look at a story from the Old Testament of your Bible. and Pretty much almost right in the middle of your Old Testament. About a man and a prophet by the name of Nehemiah. And how he had to deal with the mood and the emotion of discouragement. And this is a very real very real emotion and mood that we have to deal with in life is being discouraged. And how do we overcome that? And how do we, how do we deal with that? And how do we push through that? So we're, we're going to dive off into this story. And I'm going I'm to read some scripture to you just to give you the context of what's going on and what's happening in this story. And we're going to start right at the very beginning of Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. And again, it's almost in the middle of the first part of your Bible in the Old Testament. It's right after, an, actually, one of, his, um, one of the guys that was in a similar time and similar age to him by the name of Ezra is right there. And if Ezra, Nehemiah is the next um, book of the Bible that you're looking at. And you want, to, you want to go read this story sometimes. 
And you want to see what, how, what a true leader can do by mobilizing the people and, and, getting, and rallying the people around a common cause and a vision? This is the story you want to read. One of, the, one of the neat things about the book of Nehemiah, because the Bible is full of, of amazing stories and amazing miracles and all of these things that, that God began to do and work through his people. But the thing about Nehemiah is there is not, there's not that miraculous story. There's no huge miracle in the book of Nehemiah as the story is written out. There's no unbelievable wow factor. It's simply about a guy who had a knew he heard from God, and he had a clear vision and a clear direction and a clear way to go, and he mobilized the people around him, and they accomplished something huge for the kingdom and the purpose of God. And I know that you and I can relate to that today because we feel like that we don't have these huge miraculous things happening in our life. Well, guess what? This guy didn't either. He did. There was no parting of a Red Sea. There was no, nobody's eyes were open that were blind. Nobody was raised from the dead in this story. It's just simply a guy that he knew God was on his side and he accomplished something great. And you can do the same. So we want to look at this. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. <clears throat> Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. So he was asking about the people, and he was asking about the city. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, that's some discouraging news. He's asking, how, how are the people? How is the city? And he gets this terrible news because the people that Nehemiah loved and the city he, that he loved so much and the people that he had worked alongside of, they were now in great trouble and in, in disgrace. And now this city is broken down, the walls are burnt down, or the gates are burnt down, the walls are broken down, and it is just a very sad and discouraging day for Nehemiah. Let's go to, let's go to the next chapter, Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 1 right here and just pick up some more of this story. In verse 1, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And he said, I was very much afraid because the king, well, he was the king. And if he had something that, he, that came before him that he didn't like the way it looked or the way it sounded or the way it felt or the way anything, he could immediately have something done about it. And if he didn't like what Nehemiah was saying, he could just simply tell the guards, take this man out and kill him. I don't want to hear such negative news. I don't want to be around somebody who's sad. You don't have that option. If somebody's sad around you, you can't, you can't do away with them. You have to deal with them. But so the king does, goes on, and this is what Nehemiah says to him. He said, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Get back on his good side. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And through the rest of this chapter, the king asked Nehemiah, well, then what, what is it that you want? What is it that you need to do? And Nehemiah has this moment of inspiration. And he asks if he can go and rebuild the wall and go work on the city that he loves so much. And the king grants him the request and Nehemiah heads out and He's going to turn a negative situation now into something positive, something that is sad and discouraging and something that is overwhelming. He said, I'm headed out and I'm going to do something good about it. But when he gets back, and we're going to move through the story, and when he gets back to the city and he gets back to the people, here's what he encounters. Nehemiah chapter 4 if you move along, if you're following along in your Bible, if you have your notes, you can pick them up at the door also uh, with the sermon notes today. 
Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. He says, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. So they got the wall built halfway up. We're making progress. We're, we're, moving, we're moving forward. We're seeing good things happen. And then the next three verses begin to talk about a guy by the name of Samballat and Tobiah. And they begin to hurl insults at him. And they begin to tell him that they couldn't do it. And these two guys actually got very angry because they're rebuilding the wall. And they begin to tell him, you're not going to be able to finish this. You're not going to be able to do it. We're going to kill you. We're going to stop you. And they begin to discourage the people that are working. And check out what happens. And this is where we're going to break this down through the scripture. And I want to read through it quickly. And then we're going to break this down. But it's starting at verse 10. He said, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. And in verse 12, then the Jews who live near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Now they're having to deal with discouraging news. Now they're having to deal with reality. Now they're having to deal with life. And for some of us, that's where we get. We're encouraged for a moment. Hey, I'm going to be able to go do this and take care of this. And then opposition comes against us. And then discouragement begins to take over. And the thing about discouragement is this. It's very contagious. It's very contagious. And and through through this block of scriptures, I want to look at four things that we get discouraged. Four reasons that we get discouraged. And not only not only going to talk about what they are, but what we can do about them. And check this out. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10, the first part of that scripture. He says, meanwhile, the people in Judah said the strength of the laborers is giving out. The first reason is fatigue. Fatigue. Sometimes you get discouraged simply because you are just tired. You're just tired. He said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. It's giving out. And when you're feeling discouraged, sometimes it's because you're just worn out, whether it be physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I've had moments in my own life where I thought, I can't take another step. And it's not because I've been working out or or working hard, but it's because the mental pressure of what's happening in my world is crashing down on me. And there's been moments that I think, I am so tired. And you hear a lot of people sometimes talk about, and maybe you've been there, I'm just tired. Not physically, but mentally and emotionally. And sometimes we get so worn down and we we allow discouragement to just take over our life because we're simply tired. This is hard for some of us, especially, especially me. I, I, I just have a hard time sitting down. But sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is rest. Sometimes that is the most spiritual thing you can do because you just go, 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 go. And there's somewhere along the way, and Ali talked about it a while ago, just be still, take a deep breath, and know that God is still God. Because tired eyes rarely see a bright future. Tired eyes, tired eyes rarely see a bright future. The mountains seem bigger. The valleys seem deeper. And sometimes you just get tired of fighting the fight. And you have to find a way and a place to rest. So maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, you know, life's not going any way that I planned it. My, my finances are a wreck. My relationships they, 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 they run off the tracks a long time ago. My career is not where I thought it would be. And we look at all of these things and we're just tired and we're fatigued. And he said, just like the scripture, he said, the strength of the labor is giving out. You feel like you're giving out. But I want to, I want to encourage you today. Don't give up. Don't stop. Find a place to stop and rest. I love the scripture out of Galatians. And he was talking to the church in the New Testament and he's talking to the church of Galatia, and he says, So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing. Listen, if we don't give up. Don't give up today. I, you, you, you may say, well, Pastor, you don't understand how tired, are, tired I am. Don't give up. Find a place to stop and to rest. The second reason in this scripture for discouragement in this passage is frustration. It's frustration. 
Some, sometimes we deal with fatigue. Sometimes we deal with frustration. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 10, the rest of verse 10, and they said, there is so much rubble. There is so much rubble. They were frustrated because things were not going right. Remember, Nehemiah had the big, you know, the big positive moment. We're going to go rebuild the wall. Now, this is what's happening. They're trying to, they get it halfway up, and this is what's happening. And maybe you feel like you've got some things halfway up in your life, and now you're just frustrated. Things aren't going right. There's so much rubble around me. But to conquer frustration, to conquer frustration, you must remain intensely focused on the outcome and not the obstacles. Because there's going to be obstacle after obstacle And there's going to be situation after situation. But when you're focused on the outcome of what God is doing in your life, it helps you overcome frustration because we can't be fixated on our circumstances. And too many times that's what happens. We look at the rubble around us and think it's impossible. And we take our eyes off of the wall that is being built that God's called us to do. This this thing that God has called us to build and this thing God has called us to raise up We take our eyes off of that and we just begin to look at the rubble and all the broken pieces around us. And we get very frustrated. And they look around us and there's so much. Can you imagine this wall going around the city? And as far as you can see, it's just rubble. Just where it's just broken down. And you're thinking, we're never going to finish. Where do I even start would be one of the questions. And it seemed overwhelming. And it led them to frustration. The third thing out of this section of Scripture, they were fatigued, they were frustrated. And the third thing, and the third reason for us with discouragement sometimes is failure, is failure. The rest of of verse 10, and he says that we cannot rebuild the wall. Remember, early in the Scripture, Nehemiah is setting it up. We're going to go do something great. And now people are looking around saying, we can't even do this. We can't even rebuild the ball. We we can't even finish. What if we don't finish? It's halfway up, but what, what, what if we don't finish this thing? And we can all relate to this. And that I can't handle the pressure anymore. Don't I can't I can't keep going this way. What if this doesn't turn out like I think it's gonna turn out? What if what if it really isn't gonna be okay? And well, that puts us in a terrible mood. And that allows discouragement to really just beat down on us. But I want to encourage you today, don't believe the lie that you can't do it. You can. God is with you. God is for you. And when you get tired and you get frustrated and you feel like things aren't going the way they should and you just want to quit just because you can't keep going, just because of what of the failure when I look at my marriage or I look at my relationships or I look at it with my kids, I just can't keep going. When I look at my finances and I think this is not going to work. When I look at the things that are happening in my life and the decisions that I've made or the decisions that others have made that are impacting my life. And I'm thinking, what if this doesn't work out? And the fourth thing from this is Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 is fear. And this is the one that paralyzes us. Because we have the frustrations, we have the failure, we have the fatigue, but fear will paralyze you. The last couple of days, my kids, for whatever reason, it's highly entertaining because of the age gap between them. They're almost 17 and 9 now. But they've they've gotten into this thing where they're they're waiting around the corner to, to scare the other one. And it's been for the last three days. And every time I turn around, I hear one yell and I hear the other one scream like a girl. And it just alternates to, between the screams. And so yesterday they, were, we, they did this and we were, I was sitting close by and, and Blake comes up behind Brady and he, and he grabs him and gooses him again. And, and, and I'm watching it happen and it, it scared the fire out of me. And, I like, and, and I'm like, ah! And I caught myself, you know, that feeling of just, oh, I can't move just for a brief moment. And I'm watching it happen. And, and when, we, when we have those moments of fear, and in those brief moments, that's kind of funny. But in those moments of life where you don't know what to do next and you feel paralyzed, 
fear begins to take over. Verse 11, he said, also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. <laughs> death, th- death threats are pretty discouraging. I don't know how many you've had in your life. Um, I had a good friend of mine who had one uh, one time. He, we, we, weren't, we weren't throwing a party when, when he got the letter. It's not a lot of fun to deal with that. And then verse 12, he said, Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over. <laughs> Ten times over, just, we're just going to keep telling you. Look, man, I don't know what to tell you, but wherever you turn, they're, they're going to attack. Can you imagine just, okay, all right, get back to work. Hey, 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 wherever you turn, they're, they're going to attack us. Okay, okay, I'll go work over here. Hey, hey, we're, that's going to get very discouraging. That's going to allow fear to set in so that you begin to look around and you can't accomplish what you need to accomplish because fear is taking over your life. And for some of you, you can't live out your God-given dream and potential and the the dreams that God has placed in your life because of the fear that seems to have overtaken you. The fear of the unknown. The fear of what others are saying. The fear of our own made-up scenarios. I'm king of that one right there. Doubting our abilities, and you live your life in a sense of fear, not sure what the future holds, not sure what's next. But I want to encourage you today don't give up on your dream, don't give up on your family, don't give up on your finances, don't give up on your career, don't give up on your marriage, don't let these feelings of fear stop you and rob you for what God has for you. Because sometimes we get to the point where we just want to throw in the towel. But when you get there, you have to do what Nehemiah did. And he learned how to defeat discouragement. And so today, whether it's fatigue or frustration or fear or dealing with just this moment, I just really don't know if I can go on. I don't know. What if I fail? I want to look at real quick. Three ways to overcome discouragement based out of this same, this same book of the Bible. The same book where we picked up all of this discouragement. We're going to go right back to it and we're going to look at how to overcome discouragement in your life. Number one is reorganize. Reorganize. The people built the wall halfway up. And the Bible says that they were working with all of their might. And then they begin to question everything. Why? Because they were tired. There just wasn't enough fuel in the tank to want to finish. And maybe you're second guessing right now and wondering if, I just don't know if I can just keep going like this. And I want to challenge you this morning to take a step back. And maybe you need to reorganize some things in your life. Just because you're discouraged doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It just may mean you're doing it the wrong way. It's kind of like this. In your marriage, if you feel like it isn't working, don't just run away. Approach your relationship in a different way. You know, the cute little phrase is, date your mate. As corny as that sounds, that's probably not a bad idea, though. Spend quality time together. And quality time is not driving down the road, Facebooking and texting the whole time. If you're doing that while you're driving, you may get to meet Jesus sooner. And in San Antonio, you get to meet one of the judges a lot sooner. Quit taking your kids out on date night with you. That's, That's family night. That's not date night. Find a babysitter. Maybe you should quit buying flowers and cologne. Please don't throw anything at me, ladies. Some of you are thinking, quit. <laughs> How about start? Right, y'all work that one out. Why don't you figure out what their hobby is, what they enjoy? Buy them something that directly impacts their hobby. Buy them something that directly impacts what they enjoy. Put a little bit of thought into it. Anybody can order a dozen roses. If you haven't in 20 years, order some today. 1-800-Flowers.com. It works. Yes, that is the correct address, and yes, I did know that. Maybe it's in your finances. You say, man, I just feel like I'm, I'm broke. It's because you are. It's because you're spending more than you make. 
It's a pretty neat concept if we live on less than we make. Uh, you'd be amazed at what happens. I mean, it's just, and sometimes we just need to reorganize the way we look at our marriage. We need to reorganize the way we look at our finances. Yeah, when we, when we feel like our money's so far out of whack, my first question to anybody is, well, have you tried a budget? A lot of times I get an answer of no. Maybe you need to, and our small groups will be kicking off in, the, in, in a few weeks for the fall semester. Maybe you need to get in one of our financial small groups, get some accountability, get some instruction, learn some things. We have, we'll have two different ones going. Both of them are incredible content, and you will learn a ton about how to handle your money. Seek wisdom. Get counsel. Reorganize. Repower. Whatever it is with your kids, with your career, whatever it is, you may need just to back up and look at it. So you can go from being frustrated and discouraged to living the life God has for you. Live, and he said, I want you to have life and life to the fullest. That's the life God wants for you. But whatever you do, do not make permanent decisions based on temporary feelings. Check this out. Nehemiah 4 and 13. And this is where he began to reorganize. He said, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. He reorganized the way the people were working, but not only the way they were working, but just how they were standing around. Nehemiah took a plan and said, okay, these people are discouraged. These people are getting down. They're feeling frustrated. They're feeling like we can't do this. We need a new plan. Maybe in your life, you need a new plan. You need a place that you look at and say, okay, if I do this differently, what will the outcome be like then? Because maybe I'm not doing something wrong. I'm just doing it the wrong way. So Nehemiah goes and he puts people together. Instead of having them work alone, he put them in groups. He didn't want them to carry the burden by themselves. He didn't want them to carry the burden alone. He said, let's do this together. We can be there for each other. That's one of the main reasons we have small groups at North Rock Church. Because you don't want to do this alone. You don't need to walk this road by yourself. You don't need to try to carry this burden alone. Because our small groups provide a place for you to connect with one another. A place to protect a place that you, a safe place that I can come into, and then also a place to grow, a place to grow in your faith, a place to be encouraged where somebody can speak life into you, where someone can speak hope into your life, and you don't have to walk this road alone. And with our small group semester getting ready to kick off, if you're interested in leading a small group, if you want to meet with me after the third service today, right at, the, at 201, when Danielle talks about 201, I'll be right there. And if you would like to lead a small group and you want to be a part of this life-giving culture, saying, I want to help people come along, I'd love to see you after the third service, and I'll point you in the right direction of what we need to do and what we're looking like for the fall. Because you need people to speak life into your life. You need people to speak hope into your situation. And that's what Nehemiah did. He reorganized, and when he did, it changed how things were going. You just may need to shift a few things around. The second thing he did is he told them to remember. Remember. Nehemiah 4 and 14, he said, After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Check this out. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. When you're discouraged, you need to remember that you are not alone. When you're in the valley of discouragement and you feel like that it can't get any more difficult than it's getting, you need to know that God is with you. He said he would never leave you, he would never forsake you, and that he is there for you and he's there with you. For some of it today, it's just a matter of putting your attention back on Jesus and quit and stop fixating on the circumstances around you. And he challenged them to remember why they are doing what they're doing. He challenged them to remember why they're doing it. Because most people don't get burned out because they're doing too much. They fail to remember why they're doing what they're doing. And when you feel like you're in this, this monotonous grind, and you feel like life is just constantly, it's easy to get discouraged on that. And here's something I found with people, and this is in leadership and this is in life. When people lose their why, they lose their way. When they lose why they're doing this, 
they tend to lose the way they're going. And maybe you're asking today, why does, why does God have me in this purpose, in, in this place? Is his purpose being fulfilled in my life? What's, what's going on here? And you need to stop for a moment this morning and remember, remember. Maybe you need to remember God's goodness to you in the past. For some of you, that, that's, that's just taking a, a slow, deep breath right there and knowing that there's been times in your life where God was with you. Maybe for some of you, it's God's closeness to you in the present, in the present, right, right now. You know you're dealing with some things or you just dealt with some things and you know that you wouldn't be here without God. Or maybe just remember that God's power is for you in the future moving forward. And just remember, you know what? I don't have to do this by myself. I don't have to do this alone. And just stop and remember what God has done, is doing, and is going to do in your life. I got to hurry. The last thing here. The third thing as we overcome discouragement is this is powerful and profound. This will, you're just going to be floored. Resist. <laughs> Resist. Nehemiah 4, and the rest of verse 14. He said, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters your wives, and your homes. He said, remember what God has done, that he's great and awesome. He said, now you have to fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. You have to fight for yourself. You have to resist. You don't, you don't give in to discouragement without a fight. You don't give up and give in to it without a little bit of pushback. And when the circumstances seem overwhelming, and when you're tired of going, and when the enemy's coming at you, don't run in fear. Resist the resistance. Stand up to it. You say, well, I'm tired. Stand up to it. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, I'm fearful of what's going to happen. Stand up to it. Reorganize a little bit. Remember what God has done and stand up to what's coming against you in your life. James 4 and 7. He said, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You need to use the words of, Satan, of Jesus sometimes. Don't use the words of Satan. Use the words of Jesus sometimes. Get behind me, Satan. And that needs to be what you use. So after the wall was halfway up, the people get discouraged. Nehemiah rearranges, reorganizes, tells them to remember, tells them to resist. And they overcome the discouragement. And they continue to do something pretty amazing. Even though there wasn't a significant miracle in, in the scripture, in this, in this part of the scripture, they rebuilt this city wall in 52 days. Something that most said would never be done or couldn't be done. They overcame the obstacles and they accomplished what God wanted them to accomplish. I want to encourage you today, don't be discouraged. God will help you rebuild the broken places in your life. For some, it's still rubble. For some, you're halfway up. Don't stop now. He wants to see your hopes and your dreams and his purpose he's placed in your life. He wants to see it fulfilled. And it's not always easy. Sometimes the enemy starts celebrating before, before the game's really over. And you're thinking, I might as well just give up. I might as well just quit. Why do I even want to? Why do I even want to keep going? Why, what's the point of all of this? And sometimes you feel like the enemy is already celebrating your demise before you even have a chance to finish. And you feel like, man, I, I, I think I, I want to do. I think I'm. And you run into all of this. You feel like just ah, they're already celebrating. It was 1982, and it was a Stanford football game play in California, and some of you already know what I'm talking about. One of the most famous plays, it's, it's, it's actually titled The Play, I think is what it's called. And they thought the game was over, and they had already, well, just take a look at the screen. This is the best way for me to illustrate it to you. The enemy may be like Stanford for you, and they may just think, hey, we're sending the band on the field because you're done, baby. That game wasn't over. You know what? The game is not over for you. And you may feel like that the marching band of the opposing team is already on the field celebrating. But you can do just like these guys right here. And if you have to mow them down, just keep going. Don't give up. 
don't stop. Resist the temptation to be discouraged and to give up. And just step back and say, am I tired? Am I fatigued? Am I frustrated? Am I fearful? What do I need to reprioritize? What do I need to remember in my life? And you need to know this. If God is for you, who can be against you? Don't be discouraged. The game's not over. Keep running. Keep going. God is with you, and you will come out in victory on the other side. We'll say it one more time. Don't be discouraged. God is with you, and he's going to see you through. Would you bow your heads? Lord, I thank you today for everyone sitting in this room. God, there are people all through this room that needed this message today. God, this message started in the mirror. You know, we, we can't live in discouragement, but God, you've given us a plan and a way to overcome that. And I pray that there are people in this room that they'll leave encouraged today, knowing that you are with them, that they're going to keep running, even though the enemy may be celebrating on the field already. But God, that they'll just keep going. You are with them. The game is not over yet. No matter what the other side is saying, the game is not over. And I pray that people would leave this place encouraged today. I thank you for that. God, you do what you do best, and that's the miraculous. And that's the things that we can't see, God, but you begin to work in lives. Thank you for it, Jesus. Keeping your eyes closed and your heads bowed. Maybe for you today, your first step is I want to, I want what you're talking about, Pastor, and I want that, I want to know that God is on my side. But I've never taken that first step to surrender my life to him and to give my life to Jesus. And and that's what it is. It's a first step. It's not the last step. It's the first step. And if that's you today, just so I know who I'm praying for. No one's looking around. If you would just put your hand in the air right now. Just raise your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. That's me. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to join these? Thank you. Thank you. Just pray with me. You can repeat the words I repeat or you can just... Pray, pray with what I'm praying. God, I need you today. I need you to come into my life. It, it, it's not over. God, I want you to take control today. I surrender my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to in, in, encourage me today. I surrender all to you, Jesus. I give my life to you. I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. What you did on the cross was enough. And I accept that today for the price you paid. I surrender to you. Come into my life. In Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Can we clap our hands for those? We rejoice with heaven today.